Welcome. This is your vital signs lecture. It is chapter 20 in your Epidemics book. We should now see my screen. Yeah. So these are key terms. And you can find your key terms in the momentum site. These are the chapter objectives. You definitely want to review these and make sure that you can speak to each of them. So vital signs, right? Vital signs are gonna be um, a means for you to assess your patient. Um, they're very critical. Um, we want to emphasize that you student are gonna be taking your, your patient or client's vital signs um, very frequently for your assessments. Um, even if vital signs are delegated to um, uh, unlicensed personnel, you're still responsible for the interpretation of them and the meaning of them. Um, I want you to pay specific attention to table 20-20 on page 414 for your normal ranges um, and the normal ranges for age. So the monitoring of vital signs, um, it can be performed on a regular basis. If you have somebody who's in ICU and the patient is more critical, you might be monitoring them more closely. Um, and then you're also going to have your facility standards. So when we look at some facility standards, um, hospitals, you might be monitoring every 48 hours if you're on um, a med surge unit. Some med surge units will be Q12 hours. If you're in the ICU or in the emergency room or your patient is critical, you might be monitoring them every 5 to 15 minutes. In a home health care setting, you'll probably do vital signs with each visit. So if you're only seeing your patient three times a week, you might only take your vital signs three times a week. If a patient's coming into a clinic, which could be a doctor's office, you're going to be doing it with each visit. And then in a skilled nursing facility and your SNFs, you might only do it weekly to monthly, depending on your patient's status. So we're going to start out with looking at our temperature. Um, you know, this is the degree of heat maintained by the body and the difference between heat produced by the body and heat lost to the environment. So your core temperature is typically going to be 98.6. That's going to be an adult internal temperature. It's called the core. Um, and we can have normal ranges from you know, 97.9, uh, 95.5, 99.8. Um, your core temperature is going to be one to two degrees higher than your skin temperature. So when people are doing this axillary or into the arm temperatures, they're going to be significantly different. Your core is kind of your um, most accurate representation of your patient's temperature. Temperature also varies by age. So we need to realize that our elder patients um, have more fertility in their temperature taking. So children, children can lose body temperature very rapidly. Um, and as noted, your core temperature, rectal, and then now some fully catheter probes can give you a core temperature as well. Um, and then we talk about your surface temperature, oral and axillary. And remember that when you're doing an oral temperature, you need to be mindful of your patient's oral mucous membranes. If their mucous membranes are very dry, they're not going to be able to get a good seal around the thermometer, which means that you're not going to get an accurate temperature. If the patient just had a drink of something, it's going to lower their temperature. So when we're doing oral temperatures, there's things that we need to think about. So thermal regulation, this is the process of maintaining a stable temperature. We should have a um, constant stable body temperature, balancing our heat production and our heat loss. And this is controlled in our hypothalamus. So we have um, ways that our temperature can change. Right? And as a nurse, it's good to kind of know these because if, if you have like a little baby, your baby is going to lose their heat if their skin is uncovered. This would be the radiation, the loss of the heat. 
through those waves and the fact that the surfaces are warmer than the surrounding air. Um, this accounts for about 50% of heat loss. We have um, convection. So nurses use this principle to um, initially affect change in the patient's body temperature. So if you have somebody who um, was a submergent and they are cold, you can immerse them in warm water to raise their temperature. Um, just as when we have patients who have cardiac arrest and we get ROSC and we want to cool them. So we use um, pads and things to cool them to reduce the fever. Um, together, that process of convection and conduction accounts for about um, 15 to 20% of all heat loss. So evaporation, evaporation is going to be our water loss. So these are going to be patients that were maybe outside and they um, were really hot in the humidity and they lose the moisture as it evaporates from their skin. This is the body's way of cooling itself. And then we have conduction. And this is gonna be the patient's temperature of 98.6 when they're fully dressed in the examination room. If they dress in a thin hospital gown and they lay on a cool metal radiology table, their temperature is gonna drop and it can drop a full degree in an hour's worth of time. So um, thinking about that, you know, if you have an elderly patient who already has like low body fat, you would not want to leave them simply in a little gown um, on a cold table because you, know, you can give them hypothermia. So other factors that um, influence our body temperature would be our developmental, our environment, our gender, exercise, emotions and stress, and our circadian rhythm. Then we have our variances in temperature. So if you have a patient who has a fever, um, that's pyrexia, they are febrile. Um, and that would be a temperature greater than 100. And in children, it's usually 100.4. Um, the higher the fever that goes is typically the response to um, a pyrogen, so a bacteria or a virus or something of that nature. Um, these guys are secreting a substance that's causing the body to react. And then we have our um, hyperpyrexia. These are gonna be our super high temperatures. Uh, like one of 5.8, anything greater than that. Um, that could be due to a very bad bacterial infection. And then we have hypothermia. So this is when your core temperature is going to be less than 95. Um, and this can be due to extended exposure to the cold. So somebody who's been immersed in cold water, um, somebody in the winter time who doesn't have shelter or appropriate clothing. So the course of a fever, we um, initially have our febrile episode. This is the when the body temperature begins to rise, but has not yet reached the new set point. The onset of the fever may be sudden, or it could be gradual, depending on the condition. Um, the person usually feels chilly, um, generally uncomfortable, and they might start to shiver at this time. Um, the second phase is going to be your course. This is the period when the body temperature reaches its maximum set point and remains fairly constant at that new higher level. The person's going to be flush. They could feel warm, dry during this phase. It can last from a few days to a few weeks. And the third period is when the temperature returns to the normal. Uh, the patient feels warm, appears flush in response to that vasodilation that occurred during it. Um, they have diaphoresis that starts to occur. Um, and this is when they're going to be losing the heat by evaporation. So we worry about patients becoming dehydrated. Um, this phase is commonly referred to as the fever's break. So the assessment of temperature, you want to um, follow the measurement scale that your facility uses. Are they using Fahrenheit? Are they using Celsius? If you don't know how to convert Fahrenheit to Celsius, you need to um, look up how to do that and become proficient in that. Um, you want to use the equipment, equipment that's improved by the facility. 
So some facilities um, allow you to do to meet the panic temperatures, others do not. Um, you need to know what your facility wants. If your provider wants a rectal temperature, providing him with an axillary temperature is not going to be appropriate. And you also want to choose the safest, most accurate, and most reliable site. So patients who are immune compromised, you're not going to want to do a rectal temperature on. And you'll learn about that more when you get into that um, content. Um, if you have somebody who has had um, a colostomy and their rectum sewed up, you can't do a rectal temperature on. Um, if your patient is having a seizure, you don't want to stick anything in their mouth. So you just need to be uh, mindful and use your critical thinking on what's the safest, most accurate, and reliable site. Next thing we're going to talk about is your pulse. Um, remember, your pulse is going to be an arterial production. It's that bolus of blood. Um, that's going to be your oxygenated blood that's forced throughout the body as the heart contracts. So we measure it in beats per minute, your BPM. Your normal range for a healthy adult is 60 to 100, and the average is about 70 to 100. Um, understanding the pulse, right? This is the wave that begins when the left ventricle contracts and ends when the ventricle relaxes. Each contraction forces the blood into the already filled aorta, causing an increased pressure within the arterial system. Your um, diastole is going to be the trow or the resting phase of the heart. That's why diastole is always that lower number in your blood pressure. And your systole is the peak of the wave. So this is the highest force of contraction of the heart. So um, let's what? Your key terms um, associated with pulse is going to be your stroke volume. Um, usually, you'll not know your patient's actual stroke volume. It um, averages about 70 in most healthy adults. Uh, your cardiac output is the total quality quantity of blood pumped per minute. It's expressed in liters per minute and calculated. Um, by your stroke volume times your pulse rate. You don't really need to know those formulas for fundamentals. Um, when you get into med surges, they might require them. And then we talk about your automatic nervous system, which regulates your heart rate. Your sympathetic nervous system um, is your stimulation and it increases the heart rate and thus the cardiac output. And then your parasympathetic um, stimulation decreases. Other factors that influence your heart rate, your developmental level, newborns typically will have a more rapid pulse and it starts to stabilize throughout childhood. Um, resting heart rate in, can change with age. Um, your gender, women tend to have a slightly higher pulse. Exercise, you know, the more we um, work out our heart, the slower our baseline is, you'll find that really athletic people might be less than 60 and are very comfortable with it. People that don't exercise at all that have a less conditioned heart are going to have a higher heart rate. Our food intake, ingestion of meals causes a slight increase in our pulse and certain foods like caffeine can increase our heart rate. Um, stress, stress triggers our flight or fight sympathetic nervous system response, which can increase our pulse rate and therefore increase our heart contractions. Fevers, the pulse rate can increase about 10 beats per minute for each degree of Fahrenheit greater than. So if you have somebody who has a heart rate of 120 because they have a fever of 102, that's the body's normal response to a fever and we're not that concerned. Diseases, some diseases like um, hyperthyroidism, some respiratories, infections, right? Infection is going to give you fever. All of those can increase your heart rate. And then hypothyroidism can decrease your heart rate. Um, blood loss can affect your heart rate. The body is used to having that standard volume. And if that volume drops, it knows that it needs to circulate that oxygenated blood around faster to keep all of that tissue oxygenated. 
So if you have somebody who loses blood or loses volume because they sweated a whole bunch out, the body's going to start to pump faster to make up for that. Positional changes can affect your heart rate and medications can affect your heart rate. So drugs that are stimulants like um, ephedrine can increase it and then sedatives like um, opioids can decrease it. So how do we obtain a pulse rate? Your apical is going to be your most accurate. You're going to use your stethoscope to auscultate. If the heart rate is a regular rhythm, you can listen for 30 seconds. And what a regular rhythm means is that it's a consistent love dub, love dub, love dub. If you hear a love dub, 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 then that's not going to be um, a regular rhythm. If it's an irregular rhythm, you're going to want to count those beats for a minute. Your common pulse points, so your um, radial is going to be on your wrist, your brachial is going to be up at that incubular area, your carotids are going to be at your neck. Um, when we're taking a pulse, we typically compare left to right at the same time for um, all of your peripheral pulses, but not with your carotid pulse. If you take a bilateral carotid pulse, you can cause your patient to have a stroke um, because your carotids are what is feeding blood to your brain. So if you include all the blood to the brain, brain's not going to get oxygen and therefore your patient is going yeah, for sure. Um, so moving on, um, so when to measure an apical pulse. Um, if your radial pulse is weak and irregular, you're not going to want to take it through the radial pulse. Um, if it's less than 60 or more than 100, we also have the concerns the radial pulse is not going to be as accurate. Um, if the patient's taking cardiac medications and you want a really accurate apical pulse to administer your medication with, um, and infants, because those peripheral pulses are kind of difficult to palpate. And um, another thing with this is when we talk about a weak pulse, so when we grade our pulses, two plus is normal. Um, if they're one plus, they're kind of starting to get like really weak and thready. And if it's really weak and thready, you're not necessarily going to feel each beat. So that's why with that apical pulse, if you're listening to that, or if you can feel your point of maximum impulse, that's going to be a more accurate. So this is where we're going to find that apical pulse heart rate and your variances in your pulse rate. So we can have a pulse deficit, which is we can hear the beat, but we don't feel the beat. Um, the bradycardia, which would be less than 60, or tachycardia, which would be greater than 100. Um, and you always want to ask yourself, is this regular or irregular? Is what's quality? Is it bounding or is it threading? So if our patient has um, inadequate circulation, Remember, your blood is what's carrying your oxygen. So if your body cannot circulate your blood, then those tissues are not getting oxygen. So you might start to get cyanosis. So with that, you, the skin might be a little pale. You know, patients that have low hemoglobin are a little pale. Um, cyanosis, you know, we don't have enough blood coming around. So those tissues that are not getting good oxygen are going to start to turn a bluish gray discoloration. Um, and that's going to be due to the excessive carbon dioxide that's left in the tissue that's not being picked up on that um, blood cell to be carried back to the lungs. Um, and then also because they're not dropping off the oxygen to the tissue. 
So now we're going to talk about respiration. So respiration is going to be the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the body. Um, we have two separate processes for this. We have the mechanical and we have the chemical. So our mechanical process of respiration involves active movement of air into and out of the respiratory system. This is known as your pulmonary ventilation or more commonly breathing. And then our chemical process of respiration includes external respiration. So this is gonna be the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide between the alveoli and the pulmonary blood supply. And then there's gas transport, and this is the transport of gases throughout the body. And then there's internal respiration. So this is the exchange of these gases between the capillaries and the blood tissues. And we'll go over a little bit more of this and reinforce this when we get down to our oxygenation lecture on November 13th. So then our respiratory rate and regulation. So the rate will vary with your age, um, and emotions, right? If we are scared, you know, we're going to have that flight or fight response. We're going to be stimulated and things are going to speed up. Um, if we're sleeping, things are going to go slower. Um, and then our body also has the carbon dioxide regulators, central chemoreceptors, and peripheral receptor chemoreceptors. And those are just the body's way of maintaining balance. And we'll talk about those in other lectures more in depth. So we have our mechanisms of respiratory pulmonary ventilation, which is your inspiration, expiration. Inspiration is when you're gonna be drawing air into the lungs. And expiration is when we're gonna be exhaling it out. And here is um, kind of an image of the lungs expanding during inspiration and the diaphragm contracts. And then we have expiration where your diaphragm relaxes and your lungs recoil. So our factors that influence respirations are very similar to um, the factors that influence your heart. And that's because your, your heart and lungs are very much um, link together, right? Because the lungs is what's providing the oxygen to the blood vessel to take it to the um, tissues. So if you're exercising, you're going to have an increased demand of oxygen needs. So your heart is going to pump faster. And because your heart's pumping faster, then your lungs are going to have to work harder so that they can pair up and match those hemoglobins to get them, you know, prepared for the oxygen. And then they also need to exhale to get that carbon dioxide out. So the same thing as before, you know, if we have diseases that are speeding up the heart rate, most likely they're going to affect your respiratory tract. Um, if we take an opioid, which is going to sedate us, it's going to reduce your heart rate. It's also going to reduce your respiratory tract. So our counting of respirations, you always want to count respirations for a full minute. Doesn't matter if the patient's breathing regular or irregular, respirations are full for a full minute. You want to note the pattern of the respirations. And I know this slide says that respirations must be accurate, especially in older adults. It's also very important to have them accurate with your young children, really any patient. Um, if you have somebody who's coming in and they're specifically complaining about a respiratory issue, you, you want to make sure that you have an accurate respiratory rate. And a full respiratory cycle would be an inhale and an exhale. That equals one. So your variations in your assessment. So we have our rate, right? That's the number of time the person breathes. Again, it's for a full cycle. So it's inhalation and exhalation. And you want to take it for one full minute. Whether they're breathing regular, irregularly, it's one minute. Whereas with the heart, if it's regular, you can drop it to 30 and multiply it by two. Rhythmia is going to be a slow, so this is going to be um, less than 12. And then tachypnea is going to be a long and fast, which depending on what literature you're reading, it's usually faster than 22. 
and you're going to want to know the depth. So is the ta patient taking a full, normal respiration? Are they breathing shallowly? Are they breathing deep? And certain neurological um, injuries can cause your patient to breathe very deep. You might alternate and it's more getting into the rhythm. If you have somebody who's having um, pain, they might breathe very shallow, um, especially if they're having pain in their lungs because they're not going to want to take a deep breath because that deep breath can cause them pain. So we need to really know what our depth is and then our rhythm, right? Is it regular or irregular? Um, so infants breathing rhythms are more likely to be irregular than adults and um, adults that have head injuries or um, we have like chain stoops breathing, certain um, electrolyte changes can change your breathing. So you need to know, is it a regular or is it irregular? And then the efforts, right? So to what degree is this patient working? Are they laying back and they're comfortable or do they need to like sit up and lean forward, which we call tripoding? One of the things that when you're doing your patient interviews that you're going to want to ask is, you know, can you sleep laying flat or do you need a whole bunch of pillows or do you need to sleep in a recliner? Um, and again, the more you learn about different disease processes, you'll understand why that's important. But right now we just want to focus on what is that effort? Is it labored or unlabored? So our different variations in breathing, we can have wheezing. Wheezing is going to be your musical sound. This is usually heard with asthma patients, um, sometimes with allergic reactions. Ronchi is going to be that low pitch continuous sound. This is caused by secretions in your larger airways. A lot of times when your patients have pneumonias, you'll hear a lot of ronchi in there. Crackles is a discontinuous sound usually heard on inspiration. It can be high pitched popping or low pitch bubbling sounds. Um, a lot of times crackles is your clues. Strider is gonna be a piercing high pitch sound. Um, this is gonna be an upper airway obstruction. So a lot of times with kids will get strider when they get croup. Um, and allergic reactions can have strider if that upper airway is starting um, to swell. So some associated assessment things that we want to do with this, right? So um, when we talk more about that work with breathing, we can talk about retractions. Um, retractions is when that skin's going to start sucking around those rib cage or your sternal area. Um, your hypoxia and cyanosis are going to be those um, blue discolorations, your um, pallor, and then does your patient have a cough? And if they have a cough, is it productive? Is it non-productive? What color is coming up? Tools to measure oxygenation, we can do an arterial blood gas, which is typically going to be done by a respiratory therapist. Um, some hospitals in the country have nurses do it, but I don't know of any local ones that have the nurses take the ABG. We'll talk about this more when we get into our renal, um, so your fluid electrolyte acid base um, lecture, which is chapter 38 on the FAD list, um, and then our pulse ox symmetry. So your pulse ox is a non-invasive method of measuring your respiratory status. It's typically an external device that goes on the patient's finger. The drawback with your pulse ox is, is that if your patient is not perfusing their peripheral due to lack of blood or some other circulation issue, you might get an abnormal breathing and the patient could be normal. But for the most part in fundamentals, the patients that you're going to encounter, the pulse ox device will be fine. So hyperventilation is going to be that rapid breathing. That's going to be fast. You're going to be blowing off your carbon dioxide. Um, these patients might feel lightheaded and tingling. And that's hyper. Sorry, I'm a little sorry. So hyper fast, hypo slow. When patients are hypoventilating, they're going to start to retain carbon dioxide. 
Okay, so now we're going to talk about blood pressure. Um, again, this is a good indicator of your patient's overall cardiovascular health. Um, your blood pressure is what's the force of the arterial wall during the contraction. Um, we have the systolic, which is the most amount of pressure that the heart is. It's the peak on the ventricle walls as it um, injects blood. And then the diastole is the lowest amount of pressure when the heart is fully at rest. It's measured in um, millimeters of mercury, so MMHG. It's recorded as your systolic over your diastolic. And if you ever hear somebody talking about the pulse pressure, that's the difference between the systolic and the diastolic. So blood pressure regulation, how is it regulated? Um, it's influenced by your cardiac function. So your cardiac output is the volume of the blood pumped by the heart per minute, and it reflects the function of the heart. And increasing your cardiac output causes an increase in your blood pressure, and a decrease in your cardiac output causes a decrease in your blood pressure. The peripheral vascular resistance refers to um, the arterial and capillary resistance to blood flow as a result of friction between the blood and the vessel walls. Increased peripheral vascular resistance creates a temporary increase in blood pressure. The amount of friction of the resistance depends on the viscosity or the thickness of the blood, the artery size, and the arterial compliance. So is it a nice, healthy artery that's really elastic or is it an old, stiff artery that has no elasticity? The walls of the veins are thin. They're very descended. So... Um, veins have very little influence over your peripheral resistance and your blood pressure. And then our blood volume, right? So the normal blood volume is about five liters. Um, a significant volume decrease, such as a hemorrhage or a loss of fluids can cause your blood pressure um, to at first try and increase because it's going to try and compensate and then eventually it's going to decrease because it's no longer going to be able to compensate and therefore with the lack of fluids you're going to have a drop so factors that influence your blood pressure are the same thing that influence your heart and the same thing that influences your respiratory because all of this stuff is all interconnected so if I'm having a lot of pain, my heart rate's going to go up, my respirations are going to go up, and my blood pressure is going to go up. If I'm taking an opioid and my heart is slow and my respirations are slow, you know, my heart's not pumping strong, there's not a lot of resistance, my blood pressure is going to drop. And you'll see um, in clinical, you know, you'll have a patient and you might do their blood pressure while they're at rest. And it might be, you know, 100 over 60, and then you might get them up about, and their heart starts pumping, and they'll start moving, and you take their blood pressure again, and their, and their blood pressure could be higher. Now, um, one thing that I didn't say in heart rate is certain medications will block the blood pressure from going out, and it'll block the heart rate. Um, and that's kind of detailed for this lecture, but just be mindful of that, you know, if you're in taking care of a patient and you see, well, I did all this stuff and their blood pressure really didn't go up. Look at their medicines, it could be well. So your methods to measure blood pressure, you can do non-invasive or invasive. So um, the direct method um, is done in clinical only. And this would be if they have like an A-line um, and you would need special education on how to handle an arterial line um, and the electronic monitoring that goes behind it. Um, and then there's also what we do in clinical, where we have a blood pressure cuff um, and we have a stethoscope, and that would be your indirect method of taking it. These are the different sounds that you're going to hear when you're doing your blood pressure. So the first sound that you hear is... Um, systolic, that's the systolic blood pressure, the highest um, constriction. And then the second sound as you start to deflate is going to be that wishing sound. The third is going to be a sharp, loud, rhythmic tapping. 
The fourth is going to be a softer fading muffled. And then finally, we're going to have silence. And then right, right before that silence, that's your diastolic. So the two that we record is that first sound and then the last sound. Hypotension, hypertension, right? These are medical diagnoses. They typically have symptoms behind them, um, but not always because of high blood pressure is considered one of the silent killers. So hypotension, usually your patients will voice that they're having a dizziness. Um, they just don't feel better. Um, and again, treat it as a collaborative. So if your patient has a very low blood pressure and they're not feeling well, you're going to need to contact a physician. A little bit more about hypertension. Um, so we're going to need two or more occasions of persistently high blood pressure. Um, it looks like your book is describing an elevated blood pressure as 120 over 29. Um, hypertension stage one is 130 over 39. Hypertension stage two is greater than 140 um, or a diastolic greater than 90. These parameters change depending on the American Heart Association recommendations and um, other physician collaborations. So um, just be mindful about what's normal today could change in the next year. Um, hypertension is one of the major causes of illnesses of death in the United States. Um, if it's left untreated, it can affect your heart, your renals, your brains, your lungs, everything. Um, and the severity of how it impacts is um, directly related to the degree of elevation. We have primary um, or essential hypertension. This is when we have no idea what's causing it to be elevated. About 90% of patients are going to have this. Typically, unless they go to a doctor regularly, they're not even going to know that they have it. Your, um, so our vital signs, it's a combination of skills. You need to be able to take that temperature, um, calculate that appropriate heart rate, count the respirations, remember with the pulse, it's going to be, if it's regular, 30 seconds, multiply by two. If it's irregular, you count for a full minute. Respirations, count for a full minute. In and out is one full regulation, one full cycle. And blood pressure, um, you know, you need to be able to do that with your blood pressure cuff and your stethoscope. Then responsibilities and delegation. So as a nurse, you can delegate out the vital signs. However, you are responsible for interpreting them, for trending them, and for making decisions about the abnormal vital signs. As a student nurse, you're responsible for functioning within your scope of knowledge. Professionally speaking, there will be times that you will have a tech, unlicensed professional, medical assistant, whatever you want to call them, who's doing your vital signs, and they do not know what is abnormal and what is normal. Or they just might not really think that it's important. And they'll document that your patient has a heart rate of 150, which would be completely abnormal in a med surge form. And if you don't follow up on those vital signs, it's your responsibility for noting that, interpreting, and deciding what to do about it. So just be mindful that when you're collecting vital signs, show them to the appropriate person as a student nurse. And when you become a nurse, make sure that you follow up on your patient's vital signs. And that is the end of this lecture. Thank you.